wants it again. And we're a go. Good morning, everyone. We'll wait as people get in here. Yeah, that's, that's the one challenge with this technology is it takes, even though we know there's 150 people in the waiting room, it takes forever for the 150 to come on board. Oh, it like rolls them in. Yeah, it rolls yeah. them in. Plus they're LOs, so you know it's like herding cats. They may or may not be on right at 11 o'clock, right? So good morning, everyone. Welcome, Kevin Casey, Audrey Boysenow here. So happy to have Tracy King. She is the COO of Partners Credit. And so we are looking forward to this conversation because in the midst of COVID and the CARES Act, we had a whole segment on credit and haven't done it one since, have we, Kevin? No, I don't think so. Yeah. It's been a long time. And God knows, as as with all facets of the mortgage business, there's always a million things going on, right? So let's start with a reminder that it is NMLS season. Go sign up for a class, people. Get it done. Don't wait till November 30th or God help you, December 30th. So just get it done. Get it over with. It's interesting as always because we're learning something, right? So there are live classes or online classes. But with that, we want to say thank you to our sponsors, Mortgage Educators, who has been so gracious in helping us with our Tuesday Mortgage Pros 411. They are the reason we have a website. Um, it will be, it's improving. Um, and um, we just want to say thank you to them. And then we also highly recommend the live in-person classes versus the online ones because they're different than the one you took last year. Last year, you could, you know, be working on your emails while you're taking the class and no one would know. And now they require that you be live on camera for the webinars. So, do you really want to have the whole world watching you, especially a bunch of auditors watching you take a class um, or, you know, take it live in person? The interaction is fun and nice. Plus, we're big proponents, Tracy, of people getting up, taking showers, potentially putting on actual yeah. clothes, maybe the clothes that don't stretch and leaving their home. So um, go meet some people. Go interact with humans. It's good. All right, moving right along. So Tracy, we bounce around a little bit with topics. We know you are the credit expert. There are a few things going on that we want to touch on briefly. Um, first one was that, you know, we've been watching inflation, inflation, inflation. We got two numbers last year, last week that were a little better than what was expected. Mm -hmm. So while we don't necessarily think that's the end of the pain, at least if things are even leveling out a little bit, that's welcome, welcome news. And we're really glad about that. Um, we often talk about headlines um, in the news and how careful you have to be with just reading the headline and thinking that's the end. And actually there's another issue and Kevin Casey actually found a great example of this, not just what is the headline, but who wrote the article? Uh, yes. So, that's always number two. What's the headline? Uh -huh. Who wrote it? Yeah. It really? Yeah. Is. Okay. So we found this great example on CNBC, the 12 least affordable housing markets in the U.S. I mean, and it's like, a, it's a crazy art. I'm like reading it. I couldn't even get through the whole thing because I'm like, okay, I, really? But Kevin noticed and figured out that it was written by an undergrad student. Like somebody who has no knowledge about the mortgage industry whatsoever, no knowledge about housing. They don't know what they're writing about. Like, so consider the source is very top of mind at this point. Um, all right, in other quick news. And, and, and just to finish that article, it was about the top, was it 12 cities that are too expensive? Affordable. Okay, but they use medium income, a medium, average is calculated by taking everybody in the pool and taking lining them up in as income you take all their incomes so you take all the people that make zero they were in the first bar in line and then the person made five dollars and you know maybe i don't know if they're including including kindergartners in this poll but you know or undergrads or undergrads undergrad. aren't making any money you know and and then they ramp it up to the people that you know start making money and oh wait a minute then people retire so they get they got to get skewed into the thing. It doesn't take into effect the people of home buying age at all. And right. then it says, oh, look, the, their average income was $180,000 in San Francisco. Pretty damn good, actually, if you ask me. Um, and then um, it showed, you know, average home in San Francisco is $1.3 million. I don't know where you can find a home for $1.3 million in San Francisco. 
not in the best neighborhood, maybe, I don't know. But anyhow, they then just said, hey, it takes 80% of their income to afford this house. I'm like, those stats just don't, it, they're meaningless stats. They don't make any, any sense. That's right, exactly. Uh, versus if they take in uh, the, the median income of wage earners, maybe it made sense. You know, but they didn't do that in that step. And then, then I just happened to Google her and find out, but she's just an undergrad student. I mean, she's an intern. She's not even getting paid for this article. <laughs> well, and then the other interesting thing to note is that um, there, is a, there is a little bit in the NMLS class this year where they talk about the definition of affordable housing. And what was that number, Kevin? Affordable housing, how much of your income can go towards your housing expense? Only 30%. That's what the HUD guideline is, that only 30% of your household income can go towards housing or it's That's not crazy. affordable. I mean, like, please. Oh, anyway. Oh, everybody, everybody can't afford my house. It's just like, because 30 is pretty low if I see it. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, so again, ever. just watch the headlines. A, a lot of borrowers are being spooked right now by the news that's being shoved out there in the media. And mm -hmm. so again, it's our jobs as professionals, you know, the people who actually put together packages and understand how our clients' lives translate into what they need for a mortgage and give them some sort of consulting. And anyway, the whole point being, we are people who are supposed to guide our clients and help them understand what their options are that are specific to them. And with rents continuing their upper, uphill climb, it can you can you afford not to buy a house? Right. So anyway, okay. So and also, I thought this was interesting. So MBS um, issuance, but Freddie Fannie Freddie loans that are being sold. Those. Okay, here. Let me just read this so I don't mess it up. In July, eighty-seven point one three billion Fannie Freddie in, uh, mortgage-backed securities were issued. It was down from June, but it's up significantly from the February to May period, which is good news. So. Yes, it's been a rough road. It's still going to be a rough road for a few months. There's no getting around it. But um, I was thinking about this because it's sort of like parenting, right? So mortgage business has cycles and they're painful sometimes. Sometimes they're great or sometimes they're great and painful all at the same time. Like when we had loans falling out of the trees and everyone hated us because it was too slow, blah, blah, blah. But it passes, right? These times will pass just like when you're raising kids and they're going through some stage and you're like, oh my God, I'm never, I'm not going to make it. But that stage ends, ends. So same thing with our business. So it's going to get better. Just hang in there, people. So Tracy, let's get to some things credit related, shall we? Yeah. It was kind of amazing the long list that we had um, of things that we could talk about. So let's start at the top. Oh, yeah. um, let's talk about Equifax. So we know because it has become very public recently that Equifax had a glitch. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Where did right. it start? How did that all put to get, go together? Yeah, so I mean, as everybody knows, Equifax had sent out a statement that they had um, inaccuracies in their scoring throughout about a six week period and um, that it affected all credit that was run during that time. So outside of even the mortgage industry, um, and everyone was kind of notified about it. And I know then it was a little bit of a standstill as people were waiting for the GSEs to kind of make an announcement of how they were going to handle it. Um, and then waiting for other uh, investors to kind of chime in with that. So I think people were slowly hearing back of what they're doing. And then it kind of went quiet. And I actually was on a call last week where they said, have you heard anything about this? Has anything come up? And, you know, I hadn't. And sure enough, I think the next day or two days later, it kind of came out in the news again, where suddenly, you know, we knew about it in the industry, but then there were articles and it was on, um, I know it was on like a local radio station in California uh, where people were talking about it. And um, there's been talk of um, litigation and what that might look like. And then shortly thereafter, uh, a few days ago, Equifax came to companies like us. So for those that don't know, we resell the data from the credit bureaus to our customers um, to have your credit reports, uh, issuing of how we would, uh, they would handle um, uh, being able to kind of, I'm losing my words right now, so sorry. Um, <laughs> no, we've all been there. It's okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. 
No, basically telling how everyone, how they were going to be able to, um, if they had a request for reimbursement of how to get back um, on those loans that they had errors on, what people should do. And again, it's a little bit hazy. Um, we know what we know, and we're able to provide that information um, to our customers of what they specifically said. So um, from what we understand, lenders, you can't come in as an LO and say, okay, well, I pulled this credit report. Um, here's the one I want um, to figure out what I can get reimbursed for. Your whole institution needs to collect all of that data and provide some specifics to it and then go directly to Equifax to have them evaluate and review. And then it's going to take, I think, about like six weeks, up to four to six weeks to actually get back to you on their findings for that. So. That's the, the most latest information that we've received on it as I stumbled through it all. Sorry, that word reimbursement couldn't come to my mind. Um, so that's where we hear about it now. And I'll be interested as, as soon as it came into the news, it kind of quickly went away. There wasn't much after it. So I'll be interested to kind of see what comes about in the next few weeks and what kind of findings there are and how significant that will be. Um, yeah. So as I, as I understand it, the, um, the the term was sometime in March to April is when this happened? Yeah, it was around April. Okay. Right. So if, if I were to look at like a loan that I pulled credit at that period of time, and you know I have, let's say, uh, TransUnion is 750 and my uh, Experian 750, I won't, it wouldn't matter what the uh, Equifax credit score was, even if it was 650, I still got two scores that turned in the credit, got the best scores I could get, and therefore it's not an issue at all. Now, right. if it was someone who was, one was 680, one was 650, and Equifax was, you know, showed up as 650, but it was really 680, well, then maybe my client got burned because they got a score based on a 650, or a loan based on a 650 score versus a 680 score. And no, that's where the, the mark would be. Right. should be looking for am I correct in my, my that's market? correct and like for all of you um again your 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 lending company should have been notified the specific files so Equifax came to credit reporting agencies and gave us a list and then your agency should have reached out to you um and sent to everyone these this is what the score was and here's potentially what it should have been so in some cases it was higher some it was lower and then you had to determine whether that impacted the file or not so for several of those it did nothing um right. for others they kind of figured out it almost balanced itself out mm -hmm. in terms of positives or negatives i haven't heard of too much of an impact at least for my customers of overall what's going on with that i know um, I've heard from some customers uh, for their MI companies that they've recently sent out information saying, you know, listen, if at MI they should have received a lower rate, we'll honor that. If it was going to be a higher rate, we'll keep it where it is right now. So I know different companies are managing that and working with um, their lenders to, to try to kind of move on. But again, the information coming out is slow and steady, and it seems like the onus kind of comes upon the lender to be able to kind of get all your materials together, analyze, and bring it back to Equifax. And I imagine that's going to be a bit of a, a slow process. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, this was this was not just mortgages. You said that, but I want to make sure everyone gets that. It yeah. was cars. It was it was all credit, right? Yep. So, all credit. So it, I found the timing interesting, and this is. You know, so we're always thinking about what about the borrower, right? And I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting that the first conversations were what about the lenders? And and so it slowly is trickling down to what about the borrower? Is it it has it impacted their um payments in the short term or long term and how are they impacted, right? So um I I wish that the I wish Equifax had been quicker with sharing information. And do you have any insight into why there was such a delay? I mean, this happens in April. I think they finally started talking about it in what, May? Maybe even yeah. the end of May. And then the yeah. consumer finds out, you know, months later. 
Right. Yeah, yeah that I don't I don't know. So and you were talking about the time frame. So the time frame was March 17th to April 6th. So a span of that time, but we were not notified of it um, until yeah, early June. And when we were notified about it, then oh excuse me, it was um in late May. Yeah. Uh, and then we were told, but they were like, but we don't have the specifics yet. So you have to wait to inform your customers till we give you the specifics. So there was quite a lag there. I'm not sure how it was. Um, I'm imagining, I don't want to speak out of turn um, in my speculations of, of notifying who they needed to notify of this and what they would have to have together in order to rectify it. I imagine that takes time. So uh how long that takes, one would question if it should have taken a month, but I don't, you know, I can't speak on their behalf. I just know the information we receive and pass along to our customers based upon really, it was, this is what you can say and how you can say it. And there wasn't much wiggle room of our interpretation. They were very specific of what we could share. Right, interesting. So, so they have fixed it. So it brings up a question about the algorithms, right? So this is where the mix up happened. They were adjusting algorithms, something went a little wrong or off and that's where there was an issue, right? But mm -hmm. I'm always curious because we are, you know, we're quoted algorithms, whether it's, we're talking about appraisals or, you know, running DUNLP and, you know, so you've got all these automated models that are being created and run, but we have some insight into what that translates into for the consumer, but I'm always fascinated by where did they get the information for this? They swear it's based on data. I don't always believe them, but do you, um, do you know much, do you in algorithms, anything? I don't know too much about the algorithms. They hold this really closely to their chest and how um, it all works. I know we've had some insight and I've had conversations with different parties that kind of look at simulating how to adjust scores and understanding that there's different, within the whole scoring model, there's different score cards. So it's like a specific type of borrower. They kind of look at who you are as an individual based upon different credit attributes. So there's five main attributes and that's your payment history, um, the amount that you owe on how much total credit have you used, um, length of the, the history, how long you've had that credit and new credit, if you've opened new credit. And then finally the types of credit you have, whether it's installment, revolving, et cetera. So all of those are looked at and have different weight held to them. So kind of the order in which I, I spoke of them is the way in descending order of how much it impacts your score. But it's important to know that within those scoring models too, they section people off and see kind of what type of borrower they are. So things might weigh heavier for one person than they do for another. Um, and there's a lot of question marks around that. Of That's why it's so hard to navigate at times credit scores because you think one thing will work in actuality if you improve something it can bump that person into a new scorecard where things are weighed differently and, and don't have that just as an impact so you know I'm sure as an LO you've pulled someone's credit by mistake and you're really scared that that inquiry is going to drop their credit score well if you notice there's some borrowers where it drops their score two points and there's some borrowers it drops it 20 points so all of those are dependent on the other attributes of the credit report and how heavily it weighs. So that's where it's really tricky of how um, you need to look at things and use resources around you to kind of help guide you along the way, because otherwise, you know, for time's sake and for money's sake and the borrower's sake, just taking a, a stab at it because you think you know credit it can sometimes lead you down a wrong path. And that's where I, I see a lot of times with customers like, well, the last time I did this for a borrower, it you know brought up their score 40 points. Well, that was that specific borrower. And that's where it gets really tricky and you kind of have to pause and um, put the ego to the side and, and, and utilize what you have in front of you to help you guide you there. So LOs don't ever make mistakes around running credit and they don't Never. have egos, no egos. So it's fine. That yeah. is an issue. But I think this, this thought about the scorecards is interesting because 
I don't think it's something a lot of us think about all the time. We we are we've learned a few things. We know that too much debt, we know proportion to available credit. We know obviously making your payments on time is a biggie, but we this scorecard idea where there are different sort of buckets, right? Yeah. Where this is all being calculated because I know back before the meltdown, I would have somebody with an 800 credit score, but $125,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I wouldn't lend them anything. And sure enough, they lost their houses. Right. And so I just, you know, I, okay. I'm sorry to be such a dinosaur, but mm -hmm. I really miss the days when you'd run a credit and you would say, okay, you have 30 years of great credit, but you have one late with Sears. Why is that? Oh yeah. Everybody has a late with Sears, of course. Okay, so this is a, a, a credit worthy borrower versus, okay, you know, the scoring model says that your 30 years of perfect credit has now been obliterated by the fact that the gas card that you had for 50 years, like I guess they, yeah, I had someone, they, they had a gas card for 50 years, I'm not joking, and they were in their 80s and they wow. used it and then didn't ever get a bill. Like, I don't know where it went, but whatever. And it dropped their credit scores 100 points. Does that reflect really on whether they're going to pay all their bills in the future or was it a mistake? And why isn't there more of an allowance for a one-off mistake? I, I would like to know if you have any idea about that. I All I know is that they do that, but they, you know, they weigh late and heavier, the more recent they are, obviously. Right. Um, so if it's kind of a one-off, it's hoping that it'll balance out. But again, it's, I'm not the only one that thinks this, um, that our scoring methods are antiquated. They haven't been reviewed or changed in a very long time. Um, and a lot of it's counterintuitive. So Audrey, just kind of what you're talking about, a lot of people feel like, okay, I'm gonna get a credit card, I'm going to go shopping and I'm gonna be really responsible and pay it off. Every month I'm paying off my credit cards and I wanna get the points or whatever, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And that brings down your credit score. So just you think you're being um, financially responsible and doing all of this right. by having that zero balance. It looks like you're not utilizing it. You're not rewarded for that. Right. So a lot of times they'll say, oh, go put $25 on your credit card and leave it there. And then it could bump up your score significantly. Now, you know, your average person, then it's difficult to maintain that. Um, it's difficult to maintain in every month. Look, okay, I, I can't use more than 20% of this if I want to fall under this bracket. And, you know, you're working with borrowers where it could be the difference between a 680 and a 720 of having someone just over or under that threshold. So yeah. for, you know, all those listening to, it doesn't have to be horrible credit at all. You have borrowers that are in a position where you can take them up to the next score level and get them a better rate or look at different ways of handling their loan that could be significantly different for that borrower just by paying down their cap one card by $200. I mean, yep. of course there's things outside that, but it could be that simple sometimes. And sometimes when we run like the scoring model, you know, that will be within our credit reporting sure. company, it will say, you know, pay this down to $10, this account, which is interesting because again, to, speaking to what you just said, sometimes paying it off is not the best way forward, which is yeah. fascinating. But yeah. again, this idea that we all have to manipulate the system like this, and that's, I know that's a terrible word to use, but that's how it feels. And you're, you're supposed to manipulate it just right, but not too much, which takes me to the next question about, you know, I work for a company that was convinced that um, rapid rescores were credit manipulation, but I've also sat in sessions with people from the GSEs where they said we have an obligation to make sure that our bar that your borrowers have the have access to the best rate possible. And if you're not doing that for them, then there's a problem there. So how do you how do you balance all that, right? Right. I think you know it's really interesting. I was at. Um... Michigan had a conference a couple of weeks ago and I was listening to a panel and a guy said, I don't like being called a loan officer. I'm a loan advisor. And um, part of that is advising the borrower on how to help themselves or, you know, improve or do whatever they need. And a lot of this falls under what's on the credit report. 
um, that is um, fair and accurate? Do they have 20,000 lakes that clearly this person isn't um, do, handling their finance as well? Or did they just go out and purchase something and credit is fluid. So it's constantly moving it. Your score can be different today versus tomorrow. And it captured um, all of their credit cards at a moment in time where they hadn't made their most recent payment. And so there would be a lapse there. So I know that there's different institutions that look at what we call score updates with our company and whether or not they allow their companies to utilize them because are you kind of faking it that they can make things on time or are you kind of showing this is actually where they're at or there has been an error that Sears late it was an error they mailed it to the wrong address they've fixed it with that company and that makes a difference between them getting a loan with you or not so you know everyone should kind of have you know I know everyone does but you know working with their compliance team to what that looks like and where you are utilizing it and also who you're utilizing it for. So I think the biggest question now, and I know you have the CFPB coming next week and you've got lots of things lined up, but making sure that there, if you do offer assistance in improving scores, that you as a company are kind of looking at what borrower you do that for and are you consistent in offering that? So not just having an LO that's better at it than the next person. Um, you want to make sure that that's something that you're offering and saying, look, if, if, if someone's at a 640, we look at this and we see if there's an improvement and we work with our team um, to help them. And I know certain companies have a specific team that does this, where they review the files that are moving forward, and they've been extremely successful in that and wow. have, seen, have seen the profitability from doing that, of looking at how they can improve it and making sure that they're um, uniform in how they're handling it. Well, that is interesting because again, in our NMLS this year, there is a reference to this and it's called disparate treatment. Mm -hmm. If you are not doing the same um, improvement or activity or evaluation for everyone. So be aware of that and make sure, but again, ultimately, what are we doing? We're trying to help our clients, right? That uh, for us, that's the trickle down. down. I don't know why these, these uh, credit bureaus don't call the LOs going, all right, what are you seeing? What do you think? I mean, we have been put into this, right? We knew something. Right. If yeah. you've been looking at credit reports for 30 plus years, you might have noticed a few trends that may or may not seem to reflect themselves in algorithms and credit scores, right? So um, I love that idea of having, again, like, because how do you do that? Having some way to evaluate the credit reports and make sure that we're maximizing, but not, but also you don't want to mask that someone's a terrible borrower and will never make a payment. You don't, want, you don't want to like put paint a picture that is going to lead to a default later, right? So again, you're balancing. It's always a balancing act, isn't it? Yeah, so well, and setting parameters. Like the more parameters you have surrounding it, the, the least like you, likely you are to put yourself in a position to be looked at differently. So, um, and there's so many files in which, it, and it's not something that needs to be significant, which I, I wanna, we were talking about before we got on the session about, and I don't know if we wanna bring it up later or now, but talking about, credit repair um, or um, you know how you deal with files. These are things that once you have someone, if you do have a team that is looking at this specifically, um, it doesn't take a lot of time. It can be done very, very quickly uh, so that it doesn't waste your resources or take up a time suck, but it can make you stand out incredibly. Yeah. Well, so I, I talked about this before where I had a client recently where I did the refinance when rates were two and a half percent and their credit scores were 800. And then they came back to do another loan for a different property. And her score had dropped tremendously because her husband had forgotten to make a target payment. Right. So this is not a ref She was horrified. Right. I mean, horrified. You can't even imagine the angst this poor woman went through. She's an 800 credit score borrower. She is not a you know, right. 699 or whatever. So anyways, I figured out what it would take to get her score back to some semi-acceptable level. And it would have cost a thousand dollars, almost a thousand dollars, you know, if we had this over a $50 account, right. And then update it for each bureau for each account. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
we did all those activities and then just waited and her score went up to 743 which got her you know it was better not great and um but still it was something so there are different ways to go about all this but you do have to be fair i hadn't even thought about that honestly until the you know the idea that they're looking at this when they're auditing files they're looking at that that's why that's a slide in the nmls at eight hours this year they want los to be thinking about it make sure you have a consistent way that you are approaching your borrowers and treating them equally so um, i just want to quickly go back and make sure that we adequately explain the question around reimbursement the term reimbursement that was used earlier and i um i again there well, i forgot that word about for five minutes before i <laughs> i know it seemed like you know five minutes but it was really like <laughs> 10 seconds so um anyway so just you know when the the lenders sell their loans to the GSEs, they pay a certain price. And if they are um, paying for a credit score that was inaccurate, they may have gotten a worse price or a better price. Am I, is that correct? Yeah. Tell me yeah. if that's right or wrong, um, Tracy. Right. But so, um, yeah, so reimbursements, it could be also though in reimbursements for like reports that they pulled. It, mm -hmm. Again, it's a little open. Sure um to interpretation so when we when we received the letter from them it just said that they have created a processor for uh reseller customers and lenders to submit reimbursement requests directly to equifax okay so um, and it just said related to the recent equifax credit score issue so yeah. i imagine that can be the bulk of everything now those scores going back to that they didn't necessarily mean that the scores were lower than they should have been. They could also have been higher, am I correct? They were, right. So that's where I was talking about where, you know, for the percentage of reports that it impacted, some were above, some were below. Um, so that the, it, it kind of was like, if you've got better pricing or worse pricing, technically it should even itself out. Correct. But regardless, yeah. But for some lenders that, you know, thought they were buying a loan where the person had an 800 score, and then it turns out that they only had a 680 score. You know, mm -hmm. now they're sitting on that loan is sitting on their books, and they paid you know x number of dollars for it, and now mm -hmm. it's like, wait, wait, we over we overpaid for that loan. You know, they're the ones who actually out money versus the consumer came out better because they got a better rate. Um, you know, is Equifax going to go back and reimburse lenders at gave loans to people that they shouldn't have. I have highly doubt they're going to do that, but. <laughs> and but moving, right along. Easy to fix. moving right along. All right, well, let's the consumer side of that is easy. If they got a lower score and they got a, a little bit higher rate, the lender can easily just, you know, we're going to tweak your rate and adjust it because you, you were misquoted and now your rate is this price. And we would have paid, given you that rate at that date anyhow. So there was no loss to us. Um, but for the, the one where there's a loss is where the bank lent and gave it a lower rate and now they should have been higher. So there, there's the big loss, not in the, on the consumer side, but everyone's focusing on the consumer. Right. Uh, no, no, no one was focusing on the consumer. That was my gripe in the beginning. No one gave a crap about the consumer to begin with. They were like, oh my God, how much is it gonna cost us? How much did we overpay, blah, 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 right? And then finally, what, five months later, now we're talking about the four, maybe it was four. Now we're talking about the consumer. I'm like the consumer in my mind should have been first, but it wasn't. So there it is. Um, Jill makes the comment in the letter I saw Equifax, Equifax seemed happy that a much smaller number of people had their score drop more than 40 points. Never mind that five or 10 points can change the loan rate. Exactly. And the other thing too, the first letter I saw, it said, well, 88% of people were fine. And I'm like, oh, that's wait, 12, wait wait, 12%, 12% were not fine to potentially, and of what number, right? So the numbers were much bigger than uh, we yeah. were initially, perhaps if you weren't reading deeply led to believe. Right. So. Yeah, and to your point, I think it'll be, you know, we weren't thinking about the consumer necessarily right away, but now the consumer knows. And that's the difference is that now, you know, this was in in-house for a while, as we were figuring it out, now the consumer knows, and I imagine things will be expedited in some ways that they weren't before, depending on how much publicity this gets. Right. 
I also thought it was interesting. I didn't realize that, I mean, the agreements that the bureaus have with lenders really cover them pretty well. Yes, <laughs> yes. they do. Yes. And, so, and, like, and the agreements that we have with them as well. So um, not to go too far into this, because I have to yes. be careful, but yes. there's been lots of litigation over the years um, between consumers and data that um, appears on their credit that's inaccurate. And mm -hmm. who's, who's at fault with that? Um, and there's, I believe, you know, some attorneys out there that look for these borrowers to kind of have these types of lawsuits, unfortunately. Um, but a, there's a lot of up for interpretation with that in terms of agreements. So it's 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 challenging and it's real and you want the borrower to be protected um, and in, in all ways, which is unfortunate. People go out there trying to manipulate everything that yep. their own benefit um, rather than really looking at it a way to protect the consumer. So yeah, it's a challenge. I wish we could find some happy medium where of course we have to watch risk. That's critically important. No doubt about it. We don't want loans defaulting. We don't want borrowers losing their houses for sure. But, mm -hmm. you know, we are, there is so much writing on these algorithms. And this is just a tiny example of how easily it can go wrong and be bad for everyone. Right. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, tricky, tricky. Um, okay. Let's talk about some good news. Well, we'll think it's good news in the mortgage business. So July 1st, 2022, there was a change to how medical collections are treated. Why don't you share with us what that looks like and what's coming next? Right. So um, starting in July, and this is going to be an effort going on into next year, um, the Bureau said that they are reducing the amount of um, medical collections by 70% of what's appearing on the credit report. So if it's a paid medical collection, it will be removed. If it's uh, under a certain threshold of $500, it will be removed. Um, and uh, hoping that that will help the common borrower and help their scores. Now there's some kind of questions as to how much of an impact it will actually make uh, because the ones that are impacting the score more have a higher balance on it. And the question of whether or not we really should be looking at medical collections as impacting a credit score, um, it leads to further questions. So um, it, it's pretty interesting uh, you're talking about, you know, credit scores and why are they the way that they are? And also, you know, in the news, I know Vantage Credit just put something out where now obviously Vantage scores are not able to be used in our industry at this time, um, but they're constantly making arguments about how to build a better scoring system. Um, I'm not paid by them. I don't, you know, know everything about them, but I do think it's interesting to start looking at different ways of analyzing credit and data and circumstances. To your point, Audrey, of like, listen, we don't know what goes on in people's lives. If someone's, you know, son, God forbid, hurts himself or has medical bills and they're trying to right. figure it out or missed a payment of 79 cents or, you know, whatever, should this in impact someone's livelihood? Um, so, um, it's, it is a good change, any kind of change where they're looking at things and adjusting that system. I'm all for, because it means that we're making progress and it means that we're taking this seriously and recognizing that there are cracks in that system. Yes. So, um, I'm, I'm happy about it. Um, and then next year, um, uh, I think they're going to be looking at, yeah, again, like the threshold of like how much it should be on there, the length of time. Um, when it is added to the credit report as well. So there's going to be a few changes um, continuing on to the first half of next year. Right. So, I, I mean, I've been talking about this. My now 19-year-old, he was 18 at the time, dislocated his shoulder the last week of um, his freshman year in May. And he has since May, this is the beginning of May, because I'm on his tail. I'm like, you need to call the hospital. You need to find out who the ambulance company was. You need, and he can't find the ambulance company. Nobody knows who the ambulance ambulance company was. And, and I'm like, they'll send you to collections in a hot second. So I'm really thrilled yeah. that there's now going to be more time before those things are reported. Because even when you are doing your best due diligence, 
it, it is a ridiculously complicated, unfair process for yeah. people. So you've got this 18, 19 year old kid who is now he's going back to school. He's not going to have hours and hours in his day to sit on the phone. And, you know, he's asked for the hospital to give him a breakdown of the expenses. And it, he asked for that literally like a month ago, nothing right. yet. Yeah. And so it, this process is ridiculous. So all efforts to help that are great, but this is only for things that are either paid or under $500, right? And so the CFPB seems to be saying that's not enough. Right. So the other thing that they are looking at is like you just said, also just to add that one in of the time in which it will be reported. So it used to be six months and now it'll be a year before it's reported to the Bureau. So um, yeah, there are adjustments there, but yeah, CFPB has been critical about it again, quoting that it's a antiquated system that the scoring model that we're working under. And it's kind of like, let's look at, it's much bigger than a medical collection. Well, I think too, it's interesting that, you know, how credit scoring has been around for what, a couple of decades and it's antiquated. Uh, 1980s you know. it was invented. Thank you, sir. You're so welcome. I started actually now. I started in, he, he just pulled that. I right. know someone who was working for Fair Isaac and came out of college and was on the team. I would definitely double check his math so, just because so that, he's that, so that, old and all blurs. Yeah, when, talking when about dinosaurs. That, probably it was the 90s when we started using it in the mortgage world. Oh my goodness. It was definitely the 90s because I didn't start till 89 mm -hmm. in, in the business and we weren't using them then at all. It, it no, was a number of years. So they were working on the 80s and then right. they, you know, Right. We sit in the mortgage world, late nineties, and uh, we haven't looked back. Uh, we're looking back all the time. Well, there in we've talked about this. There are so many things in the mortgage industry that are antiquated. I mean, we just changed our application for the first time in what two twenty years, twenty right. plus years. But underwriting guidelines, um, the way we look at appraisals and comps and and jobs and employment, it's all antiquated, mm -hmm. and. It's funny. So I'll say that in a group and you've got, there will always be someone who's like, you know, they don't want anything to change, but everything has changed and it continues to change. And so as we are really more aware of serving the underserved, making sure that people have access to credit, the first thing is they have to understand it. And it's hard to understand because yeah. it's not, it's not intuitive, right? In all, all the time. Obviously it makes sense. Okay. Do you pay your bills on time? All right. Yeah. Got yeah. it. But do you pay your bills for 50 years, have one late, and then all of a sudden you're a bad risk that I can't wrap my brain around. And, and so I wish, I hope that I live to see them address well, these. And Audrey, you know, to that point, there are a lot of people that pay a lot of bills that are not reported to the credit bureaus. Right, so there is a community in which um, they don't go out and get credit cards, but they pay their utilities on time. They pay their phone bill on time. They pay, you know, all these different services in which, you know, they're trying to get themselves to a place to buy a home, um, but they don't have the credit to prove it. Or, you know, so that's also important to look at is that there are underserved communities in which this is something that really should be addressed and um, looked at. So it's not even, you know, you're talking about things that are antiquated. And every year we talk about all these new, the shiny objects that come in and all the ways that we're looking at how to improve the loan process. And yet it keeps getting more and more expensive because we keep kind of throwing things at it where there should, you know, at the baseline, there's a lot of things that we really should be, you know, you've got to get that foundation intact as well before you start putting on, you know, the fancy chandelier. You need, yeah. to, you need to fully understand right. where you're coming from. If that foundation is cracked, there are going to be issues, so. Right, well, and again, like, let's make sure this, so we're LOs right now, we know that, you know, refile fi value, refi volume is down what 80%. Um, you know, we're a little less busy than we were a year ago. Take this time to put together a program to do some outreach, put together a program where you are addressing this as an, as a need in, in your community, help people, help people, give them a reason to not push a button at three in the morning. Make sure that they're using a loan, you know, a professional who can guide them. What do you want to do ultimately? Do you want to have to worry about your rent going up, you know, 10 to 15 to 20% a year? No, 
Do you want to be booted out of your rental property when you're 72 because the seller wants to sell it? No, you know, not everyone should own a house, but a lot of people can own houses and do it well if they are just made aware that they can and, and guided. And that's our job, right? So I think yeah. the more we can do for our borrowers. Yeah, we better. start with taking classes on credit and learning how to, you know, get a certification in credit. Uh, we've all, Audrey and I know both have done that course. Um, and it's, it's eye-opening every time you, even if you take it again, um, it's eye-opening just to, you know, educate your client. And, okay, is. wait a minute, you did this, but you know what, if you want it, like I had someone, I looked at all their credit reports and like, you know, oh my God, you've got like all those credits they they've used up. And I'm like, you know what, your best thing is to pay that smaller card down first. That's easy. You can do that. And that will get your scores a little bit better and then work on this one and work on that one. Versus they were focusing on the big $10,000 line. I'm like, no, leave, leave that one alone for now. Right. And I think kind of what you guys were talking about, even at the beginning of this, of like the headlines and what's in it and who's writing it, is there's so much more information out there right now in which people are just reading that headline. Like, worst time to buy a house right now, you know, all of this. And so people move That's back and maybe it's not, but they're looking, people are looking for information. And mm -hmm. For you and I that have been in this for so long, it's straightforward. We kind of understand it. I mean, I am not pretending I understand capital markets, um, but we have an idea about it. Your average person understands that it's the goal to be able to get there, but it seems really complicated and intimidating until you take the time to explain it. Like, yeah. why is it a bad time or why can it still be a really good time to right. do this? And you need to figure out how to get your voice out there, whether it is for credit classes. Are you thinking about this? I know a lot of um, lenders that work with realtors to do classes for borrowers in the community of how to improve your credit score. And not necessarily, you don't need to use credit repair companies. This is, you know, step by step. Here's how you can get there. And it's not intimidating. And we can help you. And they remember that. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Someone was asking what credit certification we were talking about. And NAM, the National Association of Mortgage Brokers, just up finished is just finishing updating their credit certification. That's a good one. And so that's one place to look to make sure that you are, you know, just coming to your, you're at the top of your game, right? That's what's really important. Um, and also when you're going to your, um, there's a lot of shame for people around credit. I mean, think about it. If you lost your house in the meltdown and you had a horrible experience with a servicer, you're not going to feel comfortable. A lot of people don't feel comfortable about talking about it. And they need to know that, you know, they weren't alone. This didn't just happen to them, but you can recover from that. That's again, back to our job, right? We communicate with them. First of all, servicers are not the enemy like they used to be. They have been tasked by the CFPB to make sure they're working with borrowers and helping them stay at their homes if it's possible. Okay, we communicate that to them because they'll listen to us, right? But there's so much negative information out there. So we've got to make sure that we are really all over it and we are um, communicating um, it, that they have, and you can have a new beginning. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. So that's okay. You were just trying to make me feel better about earlier. And I think yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I guess I'm next. <laughs> Come on, Kevin, look at the distance somewhere and think of something. Listen, Kevin's job is to look pretty. So he gets all these compliments on how good he looks and how great his jacket uh -huh. is and how much they like his tie and blah, blah, blah. So anyway. I love your lipstick. I love your glasses. Um, oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so thanks. So just keep doing your job, Kev. It's all good. Yeah. Um, okay, so for somebody who is, what tools do you have or that you would recommend that people use um, that are available for helping their clients? Yeah, so um, most companies should have available to them, whether, I believe they're called pretty similar across the board. It's just called Credit Expert and it's a simulator that you can utilize. Uh, right now they have two two tools. It's Wayfinder and a What If Simulator. Um, I recommend both uh, in different um, 
in different kind of situations of which you sometimes can't find something on Wayfinder and you can play with it and manipulate it yourself and say, you know, what the threshold of um, money available to the borrower is there, how you can work with it. But that tool to me is, it's always surprising to me because we try to talk about it not as, it's not super expensive um, in terms of looking at what you're dealing with with credit. Um, it is not time consuming and yet people have this weird kind of relationship with it. They're either all for it or, oh, I never really looked into it that much. Mm -hmm. That to me can be such a game changer, not only for the borrower, the consumer that you're working with and what it could do for them potentially. Like I said, it doesn't have to be someone that's at a 580 and you're doing everything you can do to get them up. It can be that mid average score, the person with the target late that usually is at an 800. Um, it can really get you to a different place and also make that loan more profitable for you as a lender, which is also important these days as well. So I strongly recommend them. Um, I, uh, the two simulator systems. So it's through credit expert, your credit reporting agency that you utilize should have that. I'm sorry. Someone asked a question what it was. It's yeah. called Wayfinder and what if simulator. So um, you should work with your credit uh, reporting agency. Um, I know that we do a lot of demos and have done them lately uh, to make sure that our customers are utilizing it properly. Because again, you want to come in this with as much knowledge as possible, just like you want to be able to explain different rates and scenarios to your um, borrower. Right. You also want to know how to utilize the tools that are there in the most positive way, in the most cost effective way. Sure, you could tell your borrower to pay it down 10 grand, but if they can do it in $200, yep. that will also leave an impact to them. Right. So different methods that you can do rather than sending it off to a credit repair company, which takes a lot of time and is not necessarily always done in the proper way. So um, I'm happy if you send out people's information, if you'd like more information on this or would like some more details, um, I'm happy to, to do that. And I know we're trying to do some, some webinars around that product and how to use it properly. So not to do like a, not trying to sell anything again, it's really one of those tools I think people are scared of because they do think, well, is this snake oil? Are you just trying to get me to use right. more of your products? It's not. If I could be really genuine, it's something that would benefit you and behoove you to take a moment and learn and mm -hmm. get that confidence with it to set yourselves apart and provide a benefit to the borrower. Well, and all you're doing is communicating the tools that are, avail are available. And maybe we'll have you come back and walk people through that. They can, sure, uh, yeah. you can do that maybe separately. So there's a really good question in here from Terry. It's she or they um, asked, does opt out pre-screen work in keeping my client's information for being sold? Also, do you have to put their social into opt out? So we do hear a lot about um, opt out pre-screen and oh, do that. And what's your what's your take on all that? Yeah, I actually, um, we just did a quote for Rob Crispin a couple of weeks ago because a lot of people were reaching out to um, him and myself about the fact that it's almost a line of harassment, how much borrowers are being bombarded yes. uh, by all these triggers. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for it um, because it is a proof <laughs> that this is a right that companies have to reach out to, to borrowers. However, there are ways to sidestep it. So um, yes, there are ways in which you can uh, have your borrower opt out. It does work. It takes a few days. So my tip for everyone is you're working with different realtors. Uh, you are trying to get in as early as possible with the borrower have that as a resource to provide them with the link of how to do that. And Audrey, I can send you that information after this if you wanna send an email to everybody with that info where they can call and put their information in and opt out so that they aren't bombarded and that it's a benefit to you as well. And they yep. will thank you if they recognize how much they will be getting, you know, people want options, but not 500. So. Right. Uh, it does work, and I, I think it's a great uh, way to get out how, of it. How I many days see. does it take to take it takes place? Three to five days. Okay, that's, I've heard thirty. No. So, 
not that long. Okay. No. Yeah. So three to five days. And I'm sorry. I honestly don't know about the social. I imagine it does need to have some specific credentials there. So if it's not the full social, I would imagine it's like the last four or something, but I, I apologize. I don't know that. The only other option with that is um, if a lot of companies offer a soft qual pre-qual credit report. So it's a soft pull. Unfortunately, you can't reissue that to the GSEs. Uh, but if you are working with builders, if you are early in the process and you really want to gauge where a borrower is, I would recommend doing a soft pull. That's, um, you could do three credit scores. You could do one. A lot of people do one or two to keep the cost down. And it's, it's a lot cheaper than your average credit report. Uh, and there are no hard inquiries with it. And with no hard inquiries means that there are no triggers. No triggers. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've talked about the trigger lead bill that NAM dropped in Washington, D.C. in May um, and trying to limit that so that people aren't bombarded. We, the feedback we get from from borrowers is never good. Oh, They're, yeah. They get mad at us. And oh, what's yeah. happening right yeah. now is some of these companies are so aggressive. They're literally lying to people. Yeah. So they are. Um, so they're telling them, hey, you know, you we're doing your loan, send me your information. And that is a huge problem because now you got some Joe Schmo who you don't know who it is. Can yeah. you trust them? And, um, or Josette Schmo, just to be fair. Um, <laughs> the, but they, now they have all your information. How is that? Okay. Like, I don't, well, and it's a huge bait and switch too. So they'll, oh, come yeah. and they'll give you an, I, you know, I went through a refi not too long ago, as many of us did. And being in the industry, I was curious. So I actually called back some of these places where I was working with the lender. I had my rate and then someone came and it was like a whole percentage less. I'm like, how is this possible? You call, of course it's not, but right. you know, that's how they get you. And they talk really quickly, yep. really fast and yep. try to bombard you with information. And they're talking to me about basis points. Now I know what a basis point is. Yep. My best friend has no idea what a basis point is. And yep. so why would anyone ever bring that up on a call not knowing someone? Because they're just yep. trying to make it intimidating, make it fast, make it your head spin to, to, to get you in there. Right. So it's well, and the other thing that, I mean, I recently did something too. And, oh my God, the phone calls that, I mean, it was a lot and I'm in the business. So same thing for you, but it is amazing to me when, um, I have asked borrowers who are like, oh, so-and-so told me I'm going to get this right. You get the LE and there's three, four points on there. I yeah. mean, they have no idea. So yeah, the rate's lower. That's all they hear. But the points, does it make sense if you're 82 years old to pay that much in points? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, or any age, like, let's do the math. Like how long, you know, like we know the calculation that we do to figure out, does that make sense or not? And that's not what they're doing. So, you know, it is again our job and opportunity to make sure that we are providing our our services and our information and um, as an asset to the borrower. So, with opportunity, that, I think is like the biggest thing because what? I think it is seeing that it's your opportunity. It is, um, and every time I talk to lenders, my biggest thing is talk to people like it's their first time hearing it. Yeah. You don't sound smarter. You're making them feel you know, dumber in the situation. When you talk to them as if here's the basics and make it as black and white as possible, they remember that rather than they're not thinking, oh my gosh, they're so smart. They're thinking, no. I feel lost. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. It's, it is. Yeah. You have to make them feel like you can ask me 15 different times because one spout, one person in the transaction might get it, but the other person's brain works differently. It's not wrong. Yeah. It's just different. So somebody is asking, um, you know, we have this right to privacy. How can this be legal? And what these people is not are doing is not legal. That's the whole point. They're just, you know, like anyway, so there we go. We are at the top of the hour. We didn't even get to credit score by purpose. Can you quickly share what you have learned about that recently yeah people are just interested in in kind of what's been happening with credit scores over the last you know 12 months 18 months so we've de we've definitely seen a decline over time um probably about 20 points in terms of like the overall average but then a client shared with me uh by the different you know score by purpose so what purchase cash out refi 
uh, rate term refi. So what's interesting is that the purchase score has only really changed by you know one point, whereas the cash out refi has gone down on average about 35 points. Uh, rate term has actually gone up two points. So there's definitely some changes there that are interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, and you know, Audrey and I kind of talked about the the debate as to why that might be, and 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 uh, the different types of borrower that are coming in, and and if they are in a place to be able to get that loan. Yeah, interesting as credit debt continues to increase, and the debate over whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um, is still going on. So with that, Tracy, thank you so much. I can't believe that we have um, we are at the top of the hour. And it is time to say goodbye, but we would just want to say thank you. Thank you for all the information, all the help. We'll look forward to having you back again soon. Join us next week. We're going to have Aaron D with us. And then the week after the CFPB. So it should be interesting. We'll look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great week, guys. Thank Hi, you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you Audrey. Bye.